the Apostle Paul, the uh, Apostle to the Gentiles and the House of Israel in this part 2. Well, we remember in part 1 last Sabbath, we started this topic by explaining the Apostle Paul as a person. So we read about who he was and what he became. We examined what the scripture had to say and what the Apostle Paul himself had to say about himself. We read his letters and today we will look at Israel. Who is Israel? What is the house of Israel, brethren? We could choose any number of scriptures to illustrate the point, but let's read Psalm 138 to begin to look at an aspect of Israel that we perhaps don't often, don't think often, you know, about that. Psalm 138 verse 1. I give thanks, David wrote, O Lord, with my whole heart, before the gods or before the angels, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Now the name name and faithfulness, brethren, are the main motives, I would say, of this message. Uh, God's name and his faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. Now the theological workbook of the Old Testament comments that the transliterated English word of the Hebrew word for name is Shem. It's pronounced with long A. You say Shem. In some passages, Shem Yahweh. I'll just you know, there's some people say it's, this tetragrammaton uh, is Jehovah. Well, I think Yahweh is probably. Uh, more accurate, whether it is or not, it doesn't matter. We are not Jehovah's Witnesses, so I'll just avoid Jehovah. Yahweh is what seems to me okay. So in some passages, Shem, Yahweh is so, is so inextricably bound up with the being of God that it functions almost like an appearance of Yahweh. One example would be Exodus 23, verses 20 and 21, and the other would be Isaiah chapter 30, verse 27. You see, the name of Yahweh has a domain at various spots where Yahweh appears. It is almost like what is called a <laughs> Christophany, if you wish, an appearance of Yahweh. In Exodus 20, verse 24 is such an example, where instruction on building an altar where Yahweh's name was to be remembered is referenced. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5, Israel was to seek a place that Yahweh would choose to place his name. And then 2 Samuel 7 verse 13, King David was to build a house for Yahweh's name. Now the name of God also signifies something very important. It's not just what we would think of our own personal name, an identifier of us as a unique person. The name of God signifies his whole self-disclosure. It signifies his holiness and truth. We see that in Psalm 22 verse 22. God's name can be walked in. You see, people are to live according to its teachings, the teaching that is bound up in his name, as it says in Micah chapter 4, verse 5. I've just listed all those scriptures for you so you can just jot them down and check them later if you wish. But the point, the main point is the noun, Shem, appears 864 times, but less than 90 times in the plural. There is no certain etymology that has been established for this particular root. Nevertheless, some scholars would say the word derives from an Arabic word which means to mark or to brand. So a name is thus an external mark designed to distinguish one thing or one person from another. Now the concept of personal name in the Hebrew scriptures often includes qualities of character, existence, reputation. So for example, in 1 Samuel 25-25 there is a reference to Nabal, whose name describes his ill nature. He was essentially a fool, so we find just such a reference. In scripture, if you were to cut off someone's name, it was the equivalent of liquidating the person himself, actually erasing that person's existence. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 24, the destruction of the king of Canaan and the hand of Israel is an example of that. And also in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 14, Yahweh's desire to destroy Jacob's children was in fact a plan to remove their name and their existence from memory. Now the theological word book of the Old Testament also says this, the name chosen for a child was often descriptive of the parents' wishes or expectations for the personality into which that child was to mature. So a name was often given to a child based upon what the parents hoped that child would become. This is particularly evident in the renaming process of, for example, Jacob's name being changed to Israel in Genesis 35 verse 10. So brethren, we, I've just gone through this little background on the name, 
this little background material on a name and the name of God because in Genesis 32 there is a story of Jacob meeting Esau after many years. And this was after the grand deception he and his mother contrived in an effort to steal Esau's birthright. Genesis 32, let us pick up the story in verse 9. We'll get more background of who Israel is or what Israel is and what is bound up in his name Israel or if, it is, if, if you want me to pronounce it in Hebrew, Yisrael. Genesis 32 verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy, you see, he sees himself as not worthy, of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness, here is that word again, faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me. So he had the two companion groups with him now. So he is much richer than when he... Uh, uh, came into that land, verse 11, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I'll surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So Jacob then begins to prepare a present for Esau and he sends certain of his companions ahead of him while he remained behind in Manhaim. It's so called because he saw the angels and labeled it Elohim's camp. That night he got up, he sequestered his wives and his children away from him and he was alone. And there he wrestled with the Lord and he continued to do so until he ended up with a dislocated hip. Jacob, however, refused to quit until he received a blessing. And then we read this in verse 27 of Genesis 32. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Now the Hebrew root word, brethren, is for contend. The Hebrew root word is Sarai. Saira. It's spelled S-A-R-A. It's pronounced like having a y Y between A and R, Saira. And it means I contend or I have power. The theological word book of the Old Testament tells us about it that the verb Saira, Saira limits itself to contexts which discuss the struggle of Jacob as he wrestled with the angel of Yahweh at Peniel. End of the quote. In other words, brethren, the only place this word is ever used is in reference to to this event when Jacob wrestled with the angel, contended with the angel at Peniel. The importance of Sarah lies in the word that is derived from it, which is the word Yisrael or Israel. The name Yisrael was bestowed upon Jacob by the angel of Yahweh himself. And of course, the last part of the name El is God or power or might. And so, he bears one of the names that God used, uses to describe himself. Uh, please go to Hosea chapter 12 because Hosea provides us with more, some more detail on this particular event. Because if all we do is limit our view to what we read in Genesis, we might get the idea that this was nothing more than just a wrestling match. In fact, brethren, it was much more than that. Much more than that. Hosea chapter 12 beginning in verse 2. Hosea 12:2. The Lord has an indictment against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel and in his manhood, he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. So, brethren, Jacob's struggle, Hosea tells us, was not just physical. It was as much spiritual as anything. 
And it is, you know, in it the patriarch prevailed, which is to say that he didn't defeat God. What he did was prevail because he finally attained God's covenantal requirement of yielded submission to the eternal, which was dramatically signaled by his injured thigh. Despite his injury and no doubt intense pain, he persisted and he refused to give up until he had been blessed. Now the blessing with which he was blessed was a spiritual blessing. He didn't need more physical blessings. You remember what he said in his prayer to the eternal. We have just read it. He said, look, I left and all I had was a staff in my hand. But now I've come back and I have two camps of people, animals and belongings and all the rest of it. So it wasn't the blessing of material wealth of some or some kind of material benefit for which Jacob was looking. No, brethren, he was looking to be a changed person. He was looking to finally address the need he had to bring himself into submission to the eternal. You could say that Jacob gave in finally to the eternal, but he never gave up. The Lord then declared, your name shall be no longer Jacob, supplanter. Because he, you know, held his blood by his feet and then he had <laughs> to come out first. So your name shall no longer be Jacob supplanter, but it should be Israel. For you have striven, Sirah, and you are a prince who has power. For you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Now the name Israel or Israel appears 2,507 times in the Old Testament as a noun, an identifier of a group of people or a person of that people, but it can also be an adjective, adjective that is, a descriptor, something that describes the character of a people, the nature of a people, or the purpose of a people. It appears as an adjective many more times in the Old Testament than it does as a noun. It is, one could say, descriptive of the wishes or expectations for the personality or uh, the collection of families that was to mature. Now, as the name is applied to Jacob, it is the Lord's name of honor for him. And as a result of what was achieved at Peniel, Israel Israel is introduced to El Shaddai, the God Almighty. And when the patriarchs are introduced to El Shaddai, it is always in the context of being made fruitful, of multiplying, of being given the blessings of life, spiritual and otherwise. Genesis 35, please go there. Because Genesis 35 relates the story of Israel's return to Beth El, to build an altar, and that altar is to be built in honor of Yahweh. He removes the foreign gods from his entourage, and he begins his journey back. Once he has arrived, we read in Genesis 35, verse 9 and beyond, God appeared to Jacob again, and when he came from Padan Aram, and blessed him, and God said to him, Your name is Jacob, no longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company or a congregation of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from your own body. We'll speak about that when we talk about the origin of British monarchy. And you probably know these verses very well, brethren, because we have, as we analyze the book of, uh, as we analyze the history of the house of Israel, the modern house of Israel, we quoted these Promises of God to the uh, ancestors of modern day Israelites. Well, a nation, one nation under God, the United States, and a company or a congregation or a commonwealth of nations, you know, came from, from Jacob indeed. Verse 12, the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I'll give to you, and I'll give the land to your offspring after you. Then God put, went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar stone. <laughs> Is it that well-known stone when Dr. Thiel was making a documentary about that recently? He set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him. A pillar of stone. That was the pillar that was uh, at the foot of the British throne, brethren. Jacob's pillar stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and he poured out oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him. Bethel. Now what is bound up in this name Yisrael or Israel? Well, what is it that Paul understood or knows uh, about this particular name Israel, brethren? What is it? Well, first of all, as it applies to Jacob, it summarizes his own, Jacob's own personal story. It takes him through 
takes him through a crossroads, if you will, in his journey in life, where he finds himself persistently contending with Yahweh, with the Eternal, where he is driven to seek a spiritual blessing, a changed attitude, a changed mind. It is in submission to the Eternal. He finds himself persistently contending, no matter the test, no matter the pain. He is determined to prevail. He is determined to bring himself or to be brought into yielded submission to Yahweh. What Jacob did was prevail in submission. It seems somewhat oxymoronic to say, you know. But that is what he did, brethren. And that is what occasioned Israel's introduction to El Shaddai and all the spiritual and material blessings and the fulfillment of all the promises that flowed from that. Because El Shaddai, once he was introduced to the patriarchs, was the one who makes them fruitful. Now Jacob's life experience were not the same as Isaac's, as his father, and certainly not those of his grandfather Abraham. But there is something for all three of the patriarchs that is similar. Now what is the same is the requirement to engage the eternal and to persist in contending with him and men to the point where they progress to a spiritual state of self-abundanment, unqualified yielded submission that results in a fruitful relationship with the Father. Well, that is what Israel means. But Israel means all kinds of other things in Scripture as well. There is a reference to Ephraim and Manasseh collectively because Jacob's name was placed on them, Israel. It is a reference to all the tribes of Israel as a collective body. It is a reference to the two nations, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. So when we talk about Israel, it is important that we know what it is about which we are speaking. And Paul is very careful when he chooses these names to make sure that he is not confusing any of these issues. So the question becomes, in the book of Romans, when the Apostle Paul begins to introduce the Romans, the Gentiles, those from other nations, to Israel, why does he in chapter 4 introduce us introduce, and introduce the church to the whole concept of what God is doing by bringing the house of Israel and the nations together in the church through his calling? Now why then does he in chapter 4 introduce us to Abraham, as opposed to, say, Jacob or Israel. And he's talking about our personal struggle in overcoming, finding a way to yield ourselves in submission to the eternal. Why does he skip backward, overlook Jacob's story, overlook this whole name change from Jacob to Israel and take us straight back to Abraham? And why quote, as he does in Romans 4, verse 1 through 3, why quote Genesis 50, verse 6? Well, notice what it has to say, Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He's talking about justification. The only reason Paul is addressing justification is because he has already addressed the fact that all humankind has sinned. That's in Romans 3 verse 23, something that I know by heart. All people have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So Jew, Gentile, Israelite, it doesn't matter. All humankind has sinned. Everybody has deviated from God's intended purpose for them. And in order to be reconciled or justified, there is only one way to do that. There is only one path by which that happens. And so, what is Paul really addressing? He could just as easily easily have said, you cannot work your way back to reconciliation once you have already blown it. That cannot happen. There is nothing you can do to make up for what you have already done or what you haven't done. And so... What he's saying is that Abraham found justification, but he didn't find it by doing works. And remember where we are at in the story of Abraham's life. We are in Genesis 15. We're not in Genesis 17. You know, we're not talking about a covenant at Sinai. We're talking about when Abraham began to be worked with by the Eternal very early on in his calling in Genesis 15. This is before the sacrifice, or rather attempted sacrifice of Isaac, So this is before Isaac was born. So Abraham has really done nothing, and yet we are told that he believed or trusted Elohim. And that was credited to him as righteousness. Now the question is, 
Why does Paul overlook Jacob's story, Israel's story? Because if the issue is overcoming, if the issue is a relationship and calling, and if we are talking about Paul's view of Israel, why does he take us all the way back to Abraham? Well, the most obvious answer to that question is the fact that all the promises that flowed from Yahweh and El Shaddai to the house of Israel began with Abraham. He was a firstborn. He, Isaiah tells us that. And all those promises were passed on through Isaac and not Ishmael and through Jacob and not Esau. So what the Apostle Paul is telling us really is that experiencing the righteousness of the eternal that is being called by the Father and brought to the one who became Jesus Christ as a person to be worked with, to become part of the family of God, did not begin with the death of Jesus Christ. That process, brethren, of calling by the Father and being worked with Yahweh to have a relationship with the Father, that didn't begin with the death of Jesus Christ. No. One thing the church at Rome could have taken from Paul's statement is this. The process of calling people began a long time before Jesus Christ walked to the face of, of this earth as a man and led a sinner's life and then was crucified. So Paul was beginning to build a bridge. This gospel message, this good news that God wanted a relationship with humankind and God was building a family, the preaching of that began long ago. And it has been going on for a long time. It began in many, many ways. It began in a big way with Abraham and his family. The church, in Paul's view, does not displace Israel, contrary to what nominal Christianity and churchianity think. So Paul doesn't focus on Israel when he's addressing the church. The calling of those of us in the church, particularly when he's addressing not just Israel, not just those who are descendants of Abraham, but he's addressing those who are not descendants of Abraham, all the other nations. It is important that he begin at the right place so that the, the connections can be made and so to what it is that the Father is calling these people to do. You see, he does not displace Israel. No, Paul never displaces Israel with the church. Paul never confuses the church with Israel. What he does is he tells the church that we should see ourselves as continuity with Abraham's experience with the eternal. You see, continuity, brethren. We Are are we not continuing church of God? Yes, because we are continuity. We are to see ourselves as continuity with Abraham's experience with the eternal. A time of our calling, a time when the Father brings us to the one who became Jesus Christ, brings us to Christ to be worked with. That, for us, means that like Abraham, our faith is manifested through spiritual self-commitment. This is a spiritual journey, right? So just as Jacob's life had progressed to a point where he realized that he had to solve his spiritual problem. So our calling brings us to that place and that juncture. And Abraham, as the father of the faithful, has something important to teach us all in that regard. Number one is that it takes faith. It takes faith for that to happen. Jacob didn't have much faith. He was pretty much self-reliant, right up to the point where he was not. Abraham believed. The faith is a gift. It cannot be earned, as Paul noted earlier, through works. No. But Abraham believed, nevertheless. And so we must believe. And that is the message in all this, brethren. Not just to people who are descendants of Abraham or are Israelites, but to all humankind. This spiritual journey that we began, this course of spiritual self-commitment, is not predicated on circumcision, not in Abraham's experience, because the covenant of circumcision was not concluded until chapter 17 of Genesis. It is not even really about this ob uh, obedience, because Abraham had not been thoroughly tested when these statements were made in Genesis 15. In fact, it is not until the Eternal reiterates to Isaac, to Abraham's son, the promise that, we, that were made to Abraham that we read uh, in chapter 26 of Genesis verses 1 through 5. Genesis 26, let's read those five uh, first verses in Genesis 26. Verse 1. Now there was a famine in the, in the land, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I'll 
be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I'll give all these lands, and I'll establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham, and keep in mind, brethren, verse 5, this is before Moses, before Israel's existence as a nation, because Abraham, before Moses or Abraham, obeyed my me, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, in Genesis 15, we don't read about Abraham being obedient. We don't read about him being given tremendous statutes and commandments. We read of him being obedient because he believed. The obedience was a function of the faith. And, of course, the Apostle James tells us in James chapter 2 that that is the progression if we have faith, we will have works. There will be obedience. There will be things that we do not demonstrate that, that we do, I want to say. So there will be things we do uh, to demonstrate that faith. And that certainly is Abraham's story. You see, his obedience was a function of this faith, not the other way around. He didn't begin to obey and as a result of obedience, have faith. He didn't do anything in particular that we know of or that we are told about in Scripture to be called. And brethren, I suspect that is true uh, of us and our calling. What have we? What had we done to be, you know, to deserve to be called? Well, absolutely nothing. So what the Eternal is telling Isaac here is simply this: that because your father was faithful to me, I will be faithful in upholding all of my promises, and I will. Through you, make the promises that I gave to your father a fact. They will come about through you. And what Paul is really attempting to do is setting this story up and by quoting Genesis 15 is to get all people, everyone, regardless of national origin and race, regardless of gender, to connect the father's, you know, calling from the father with that of Abraham. He is in fact attempting to build a bridge to Jesus Christ from the eternal covenant with Abraham. In all EU, in you and all the in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, God said to Abraham. So that was his message. What he is specifically doing is bypassing the covenant of circumcision. He is not interested in referencing the covenant at Sinai. You know, he is addressing the fact that Abraham trusted the Lord and did what he did because he heard the Lord's call and he began to believe. And because he began to believe, he began to act. And his faithfulness in doing so ensured that those who would follow after him and conduct themselves as, as he had would carry on and God would honor those promises and be faithful to those promises that he made to his children. But it would be a mistake to think that, you know, Abraham's, Isaac and Jacob's calling was purely a physical thing, brethren. That it was a physical thing just designed only to promote national wealth and greatness. No, it was a profound spiritual calling. And each of those patriarchs fulfilled that calling and Jesus testifies to that in Matthew 22 verse 32 where he says that God is the God of the living and not the dead. Speaking specifically of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob who have long since been dead. But apparently have earned a place in the resurrection. Because they are viewed by God as alive. And every time that word of God, you know, the word uh, God is used the, in the New Testament, it's reference to the Father. Now, Lord is a reference to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So the point is that their calling was a spiritual calling as much as their, their family and descendants were to reap certain material blessings and benefits. Now, the reason Paul is connecting the church to Abraham is because of the spiritual nature of that calling. And he wants them to know that the calling begins with faith. In order to fulfill that calling, faith is an, is an essential requirement. Now, that was the same message he gave to Galatians. Notice in Galatians chapter 3, please. Well, Paul asked the Galatians, who had been betwitched by these folks, Jews primarily, who were essentially trying to get them to adopt the Sinai Covenant, 
the covenant of circumcision. Paul is dealing with these people because some of the Galatians were bewitched, confused about what they needed to do in order to please God. And so he asks the all important question in Galatians chapter 3, how and by any, by what means did they begin to believe? Was it from the Holy Spirit or because there were commandments that had been promulgated? Well, Galatians 3, please let's notice what it says in uh, uh, in Galatians. We are in Galatians 3. And let's go to chapter 1. Uh, sorry, not chapter, but verse 1 I wanted to say. You foolish Galatians, who betwitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. This is all I want to know. Did you receive Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing with faith? So that gift of the Holy Spirit, but in that essence that makes us alive, the spiritual aspect that differentiates this calling from any other way of living, how would you, you know, how would you get that? From where did that gift from? Did it come because you started obeying a bunch of commandments or did it come through faith which was given to you based upon what you heard? Now it is an important question for all of us because it is in essence the same thing that he is trying to help the Romans come to see about their calling. And that is why he connects us to Abraham, not to Jacob. Because that is why he bypassed uh, the, uh, uh, the covenant of circumcision. Because it wasn't relevant to a discussion of how one is justified or reconciled to God. You know, you cannot work your way back once you have erred. There isn't anything you can do to make up for it. So, how does one become justified? Well, simply by faith. And because there is a sacrifice that has been made available. And because we believe it and then because we begin to change our behavior and obey and do the things that our Father would have us do as a result of all of that. Verse 3, speaking to Galatians, Paul says, Are you foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh. You see, brethren, we must never forget that what we are called to is truly spiritual. And there is no other way to say it. You know, there is no other way to achieve what God our Father would have, have us achieve, to become what He wants us to be. We are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He is spirit. We are to become like Him. We have to learn to think differently with a different spirit. And it's not easy, especially in this world today. Now, in referencing uh, Genesis 15 and verse 6 to the Romans, Paul makes it absolutely clear that the calling is a spiritual one. Now, there are things that we must do, obviously, but uh, what prevents us from accom accomplishing everything that we can accomplish, should accomplish, want to accomplish, is a matter of continue, is a uh, matter of spirit, that is. It's a matter of which spirit prevails. And whether he, we are willing to uh, to con uh, continue to contend and persist in contending in bringing our human spirit into submission to the Holy Spirit, as Jacob said. Our struggle is exactly the struggle that Jacob encountered and that the outcome must be the same. You see, we must not let go until we receive the blessing. Ours is a struggle of persistently uh, contending with the Jesus Christ no matter the test, no matter the test, no matter the pain. We contend, contend until we prevail against, we prevail in yielding submission, completely subord, subordinating our self-will. Now, when Paul is tasked with the job of preaching the gospel to the na Gentiles, to the nations, and also to Israel, and of teaching the church, God's people, the ones that God is calling, how blend all of that, how to view it. He is guided by the Holy Spirit to build a bridge and to build a connection starting with Abraham. 
so that we can see clearly the most that is the most fundamental elemental component of our calling is faith and as paul says in the, the book of hebrews without faith it is impossible to please god it is impossible to justify it is impossible to reconcile so when it comes to the gospel and preaching the gospel the apostle paul can confidently say this in romans 1 verse 1 paul a bond servant of jesus christ called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of god which he promised before beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures well brethren the gospel is not something brand new to the new testament the gospel has been a part of god's plan from the beginning and it is a part of what the prophets have taught us verse 3 concerning his son jesus christ our lord who was born of a descendant of of a descendant of david according to the flesh now in galatians we are in chapter 3 and uh, we are going to read several verses So again, you know, the gospel is not something brand new to the New Testament. The gospel has been a part of God's plan from the beginning, and it is a part of what the prophets have taught us. Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. Genesis 3, verse 8. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, the nations, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand, to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Now this is, I would say, a tremendously important verse for any number of reasons, brethren, before, because first of all, it indicates that uh, it was always part of God's plan to reconcile all nations to himself, all humankind. You see, it was never just about Abraham and his descendants, brethren. And by building a connection in Romans and Galatians back to Abraham, the Apostle Paul is in fact showing the continuity between the Hebrew Scriptures and the work that Jesus Christ did on this earth in submitting himself to his Father and giving thanks and giving his life so that all mankind, humankind, might be reconciled to the Father and uh, be a part of the family. So then... What Paul is showing us is that uh, our calling begins in faith and it produces obedience. Now, as it relates to Paul's message to the nations in Israel, there is something that we should consider with respect to Genesis 15, 6. Now, the traditional interpretation of that verse, Genesis 15, verse 6, reads as follows. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness now typically in the church of god we have always taught it to mean that abraham believed god and it was counted to abraham as righteousness so what we do when we read it that way we attribute some merit to abraham for believing the eternal it is almost as though when we read it that way that abraham has done something to deserve his gift of faith and that cuts against the whole notion that you cannot work your way back now, most Hebrew scholars would not interpret uh, this verse any other way, but we have to understand that in the Hebrew language, particularly in Scripture, there are often, there are often a particular verse parallel statements. There is a statement and then there is another very similar to what that first statement said with maybe a minor difference, but they are parallel. When the principle of parallelism in interpretation is, uh, is applied, to this particular verse, well, the subject of each statement doesn't change. So, as it would as it would read, if you applied the principle of parallelism to this par particular verse, Genesis 15, verse 6, we we could read it as following: And he, Abraham, put his trust in Yahweh, and he, Abraham, counted it to him, to Yahweh, as righteousness. Well, you see, from a perspective of Hebrew grammar, there is nothing to prohibit such a translation. And the other interesting thing about translating is, it is this way uh, that this way is that it doesn't doesn't take anything away from 
what Abraham did or from Abraham's faith or from the fact that Abraham believed God. So it is not as though it is contradictory, brethren, in that sense. No, but there, there, here is something interesting that we should give some thought to it, you know, if we read it this way. You see, the Hebrew scholar, there's one Hebrew scholar, Rabbi, in fact, who interprets it this way. His name is uh, Rambam Nachmanides. He reads it uh, this way primarily because it should be read as follows, you know, and he, Abraham, put his trust in Yahweh, and he, Abraham, counted it to him, Yahweh, righteousness, you know. Uh, you know, the Hebrew grammar, you know, from its point, there is nothing to prohibit such a translation. And, you know, this is a different way. So this one Hebrew named Ramba Nachmanides is the one who trans uh, interprets this verse and translates it this way. Now, he reads it, it this way primarily because he does not accept that Abraham's faith is a reward born of works, but it is a gift. You see, Abraham had faith, and he believed, and he acted upon his belief, and that was a gift. But if Nachmanides reads it according to the traditional translation, it sounds as though because Abraham believed, it was counted to him for righteousness, and his faith was a reward for his belief, or his righteousness was a reward for his belief. And Nachmanides had difficulty accepting that. In his commentary on the topic, what he likes to point out is that really what we are all relying on is that in our quest in life, and our spiritual quest, it is, you know, God's faithfulness to uphold his promise, to provide his blessings and make his blessings a reality for us. And in his commentary on this particular scripture, Nachmanides writes Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 20. 3, 24, and 25. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 45 and read verse 23 through 25. There we read Isaiah 44 verse 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. And to me every knee, meaning every nation, every tongue, and every niche will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say to me, of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to me and all who are angry at him will be put to shame. In the Lord of the all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. So you see, Nachmanides' interpretation seems somewhat more consistent with what we read in Galatians 3 with respect to faith coming from the Holy Spirit based on hearing and not as a reward for righteousness. Now, this is not a reward for obedience by any stretch of the imagination. Is Nachmanides better than correct or not? Well, I'm not saying he is or he is not. I'm just encouraging us to think about the notion of God's righteousness, of the eternal righteousness in upholding his word, making certain that these things happen. You see, his righteousness, his faithfulness to Abraham, his faithfulness to Isaac, his faithfulness to Jacob or Israel, and, you know, his faithfulness to their descendants. And his faithfulness to the nations in making sure that his plan comes to fruition, that he will have a family. But if Nachmanides is correct, he doesn't help, he does indeed help us understand Romans 9, 10, 11 a little more clearly, especially Romans 11, brethren, when the Apostle Paul reveals to us a mystery. And that mystery is that, you know, all the nations will be grafted into Israel. So just as the eternal was faithful, uh, in fulfilling his promises to Israel, so will he be faithful in fulfilling his promises to the nations. So will he be faithful in fulfilling his promises to us. And if to the house of Israel, to all humankind, you see. <laughs> well, there is something that Paul knew as he was building this connection between Abraham and all humankind. He knew Isaiah 41, beginning in verse 8. You know, he was well versed in the scripture. He knew this very promise. Isaiah 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, you, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and, say to, and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you, I'll surely, I'll help you, surely I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, 
All those who are angered at you will be ashamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. Now, brethren, whether Nachmanides is correct or not is not so much the issue. But as we read through Romans 9 through 11, and as we go through Galatians, when we consider this whole topic of Paul and his preaching the gospel to the nations, his whole treatment of the house of Israel, and particularly Romans 9 through 11, well, one of the things that Paul most certainly knew is that this gospel message was for all humankind. And it would only be a blessing, as it was promised to Abraham, if the eternal was true to his word. And because that we know that the eternal will be true to his word, we should be faithful to him in the way that Abraham was faithful to him, because Abraham knew that the eternal was going to be faithful to his word and going to uphold his word and to fulfill each and every one of his promises. Now, that is, brethren, Paul's view of the house of Israel. That they will have a place in history. That they will always have a place in history. The covenant that was made with them is eternal. But also Paul knew that all the rest of the nations have a place in that history as well.